Ever since I saw the Wizard of Oz as a little kid, I've been scared of tornadoes. And as an adult, I lived in the Midwest for 14 years, and tornadoes are a bigger threat out there than they are here, although even here we are not immune. Huge windstorms scare me, and I'm not alone. Tornadoes are so scary, people actually exaggerate. In survey after survey, people consistently rank tornadoes as a more common cause of death than asthma. But in fact, asthma causes 70 times more deaths than tornadoes do. It's just that tornadoes are more dramatic and more memorable than asthma. And if you don't have asthma, you might not get it. But if you've ever had the wind knocked out of you, you do. I remember when I was a little kid learning to ride a bike, I fell and the handlebar caught me just right in the center of my chest and it knocked all the wind out of my lungs. I could not get air into my lungs and it was scary. Now this happened to me more than 50 years ago and I can still remember the panicky feeling. I revisited this feeling a few years ago. We were living in the church's rectory at the time. It was before Paula and I moved up into our own house. There was a bit of a mold problem in the basement. And we had two cats. Then we got a dog, a greyhound named Floyd. Floyd put my lungs over the edge. Between him and the two cats and a wet summer and mold in the basement, I started having problems. Almost every night for weeks that summer, I would wake up after midnight unable to get my breath. I had to get out of bed. I had to sit up for a while. And I played a lot of computer solitaire that summer in the middle of the night, waiting for my breath to get easier again. It's an awful feeling, especially when you're alone in the middle of the night. My heart goes out to anyone who has trouble breathing, and a lot of people do. Now, if I could get away with it, I would use incense every single Sunday in church. I love incense. I became an Episcopalian and then later a priest out in the Midwest where they have all those tornadoes. I was in the Diocese of Chicago, and back then, it was considered what they call an Anglo-Catholic diocese. And that means lots of ceremonial, lots of special vestments, lots of extra liturgical ceremonies. And we used lots of incense. Burning incense is an ancient religious tradition. It's been part of Christianity for 2,000 years, but it's also part of Judaism and Buddhism and Hinduism. Burning incense makes a beautiful odor, and the rising smoke is a picture of our prayers ascending to heaven. To this day, when I smell incense, I am immediately taken back to my early days as an Episcopalian in the Diocese of Chicago. But although I do love it, I have stopped using it here at St. Mark's. Too many people I care about have breathing problems. I would never want to make someone feel the way I did when I got the breath knocked out of me or the way I did when the mold and the pet dander allergies combined to take my breath away. Breath equals life. And today we think about the breath of Christ. In the ancient languages of Hebrew and Greek, the languages in which our Bible was originally written, the word spirit is the same as the word breath. And there are even hints of this in English. To inspire is to have new breath. To expire is to stop having breath or to die. In Greek, the word for spirit is pneuma with a P, a silent P at the beginning. Pneuma, which is of course part of the word pneumatic as in pneumatic drill or pneumonia. It's the word for breath, wind, and spirit. 
Now on Pentecost, Christ breathed his life into his friends. The book of Acts describes it as a strong wind. The Gospel of John, on the other hand, has the gentler image of Christ breathing on his friends. Christ's breath is all about life. Now, I've been with many people as they have been dying. It's one of the privileges of being a priest. Some of you, if you've been around here a long time, will remember Elsie Ingram. Now, when Elsie Ingram, in her later years, was a shut-in, I used to visit her often. She used to love a text from the letter of Paul to the Romans, a passage I happened to know by heart. So we had this custom. Whenever I visited, I would give her communion, and then I would recite that text for her, and it always made her happy. Well, on her last day, her daughter called me to tell me that the end was near. So I went to see her one last time. Her eyes were closed, so I told her who I was, and I told her I was going to recite her favorite lines from the New Testament. When I started saying the words, Elsie was breathing very gently. When I finished reciting the passage, her breathing had stopped. Now, her daughter and I were both struck by the beauty of Elsie's gentle cessation of breath. Christ's breath is all about life. And Elsie had ended her earthly life and was enfolded in the resurrection life of Christ. So as we think today about the gift of the Spirit, as we think about the way Jesus breathed on his friends, I want to give you something my daughter gave me. And I've told you this before a number of times, but it seems especially relevant today. She noticed one time that I was really, really stressed out. She may have mental disabilities, but she's really tuned in to the people around her, and she has great compassion. So she saw how stressed I was, and she said, Daddy, let it go. Go with the flow. Breathe in, breathe out. Now let me tell you, this works. You can lower your stress and increase your level of peace if you simply let it go and go with the flow and breathe in and breathe out. If you are not a believer, this works because breath is life. And if you are a believer, this works because breath is life and Christ's breath is all about life. Jesus breathed his spirit into his friends and does the same for us. Because of his love, because of his presence, because of his strength, we can let it go and go with the flow and breathe in and breathe out.